kind of uh, very different uh, presentation compared to the previous ones because I would not refer to a specific disease. And certainly uh, today is an excellent uh, possibility for discussing about the interaction between humans and animals because from the very beginning of the presentation we had such interaction. So from this point of view, we, we had the dogs here at the very beginning. So we will continue a little bit with that. So uh, in fact, the, this, the possibility of transmission uh, of viruses between animals and, and humans is very well known. And for example, this is a, a relatively old uh, table already because it's coming from almost 20, uh, 20 years ago. But here you can see the number of infections that can be shared with animals in terms of humans. And uh, something that it's very, very clear is that small animals, so dogs, uh, for example, as well as large animals, production animals mainly, and especially wild species, are certainly uh, or harbor a significant number of viruses that can be shared with humans. I would like to emphasize especially on the part of the, of the dog because in most of the cases, we are thinking mostly on uh, wildlife, who is the, we are always blaming against them, but we have to think that there's uh, much closer animals like, like uh, pet animals or uh, production animals that can harbor viruses that can be transmitted to humans. And this is not new, for sure, because uh, at the very end, there are a number of uh, viral infections as well, and it has been uh, referred to measles in, uh, in, the previous, uh, in previous talks. But for example, 6,000 uh, years before common era, it was already known to be present, uh, and certainly it was uh, some animals involved in such transmission. And you can see here that such interaction between humans uh, and animals in terms of virus transmission is something that had happened uh, for a very long period of time at the very end. So the interface between uh, animal and human diseases is something that has interested a uh, number of researchers over time, but especially in the, li in, uh, in the last two centuries took uh, over in a more important way. In fact, it was uh, Rudolf Virchow who recognized especially the link between the human and animal health Afterwards, it was Dr. William Mosler, who was uh, a medical doctor, but it, uh, is considered the father of the comparative pathology, especially with veterinary pathology. And it was already uh, back to the late uh, 40s that the CDC in Atlanta uh, established the division of veterinary public health. So emphasizing the importance of the veterinary public health regarding to the human diseases. Furthermore, Dr. Calvin Schwab uh, coined for the first time the terminology one medicine, and probably this is the origin for the, the, ter the typical terminology of one health that we are use, uh, using currently, because at the very end, he uh, claimed for a unified approach against what we considered zoonotic diseases. And in fact, already in 2004, the Wildlife Conservation Society published the so-called uh, 12 Manhattan Principles. In fact, those 12 Manhattan Principles are a kind of uh, proposals, rules, wishes that they would like to emphasize on research, awareness, preparedness related with uh, zoonoses as well as diseases that can be related with environment, animal, and humans. At the very end, and, and this is just a, a word cloud of the regarding the major keywords of the 12 Manhattan Principles, and uh, as you can see there, wildlife, human, and domestic animals, and especially in a holistic approach, are elements that should be considered when uh, tackling the One Health uh, concept. In fact, the One Health concept has been highlighted by Christian uh, and uh, up just at the beginning. And surely nowadays, and especially in what we are di discussing today, major emphasis should be put on zoonosis and vector borne diseases. In fact, and this is a, a map that probably is in, in your eyes for, for a long period of time already, but it's considered that around 70% uh, uh, of the emerging and re-emerging infections in humans are of vector-borne or zoonotic. So this means that there's a, a really, really important uh, role of animals, including vectors, arthropods mainly. And this, of course, is uh, emphasized, and in fact, in the previous uh, talk, both in the situation of MERS or, or SARS, is emphasized by the fact that nowadays, traveling is rather easy. So the possibility of transmitting overseas those diseases is something which is there and has been demonstrated a number of times already, as you know. So from this point of view, it's clear that uh, prevention and control are key in all cases. And when we are talking about prevention and control, 
I'm, I will not talk about the animal, uh, the human side, because it's something that has been tackled in a number of diseases previously, but I will tackle mainly on the, on the animal side, as well as proposing certain issues, especially in regards to uh, the animal reservoir. Anyway, if we have to control or prevent whatever problem related with uh, a transmission from a potential reservoir, it's clear that the chain of transmission has a number of uh, steps that we can intervene at the very end. Because one could be at the level of the reservoir, but we know that portals of exit, modes of transmission, portals of entry, of course, at the susceptible host, at the human in most of the cases, we can intervene as well. The point here is that most of the interventions should be focused at the very end on breaking such chain at the weakest epidemiological step. That's the, the most important issue, because at the very end is the, the one that probably will work better in order to stop whatever transmission. But anyway, at the very end, this kind of uh, breaking the chain can happen in all stages, honestly said. However, when looking at the feasibility of those uh, breaks, at the very end, control or eliminate the agent at the source of infection is one of the most interesting actions, probably, as well to protect portals of entry, so sometimes it's feasible, some others uh, it's not, that, uh, not that easy, increase the host defense. We have heard already that vaccine play a major role for a number of diseases at least, and of course there are other possibilities like quarantine, contention, etc. So just last uh, uh, talk has highlighted that. So I will focus specifically on this part because at the very end we I will refer mainly to the animal reservoir, okay? Anyway, first of all, I believe it would be interesting to define what a reservoir is, because at the very end, I believe that everybody has uh, a certain idea, and uh, even there are uh, published a number of definitions. This is one which I would say it's quite classical, and it's nothing new, because uh, it considers a reservoir any person, animal, arthropod, plant, soil, or substance, or even a combination of those, in which the agent, the infectious agent, normally lives and multiplies. And of course, it's necessary that can be transmitted to finally to the susceptible host. This is probably what we have in mind in most of the cases. However, from an epidemiological point of view, uh, the situation is uh, relatively more complex. And I would like to present you one definition, which is not really new, because as you can see here, it's from 2002. But uh, Hayden and, co and colleagues uh, presented uh, a number of issues related with the definition of reservoir which add complexity, and complexity that must be tackled from an intervention point of view as well. In fact, they defined uh, as reservoir as one or more epidemiologically connected populations or environments in which the pathogen can be permanently maintained and from which infection is transmitted to the defined target population. Okay. This implies as well that within these uh, populations, we can have as a reservoir the same species or different species or even a number of species. And of course, vector species must be included as well. However, this particular definition of reservoir implies certain definitions or sub-definitions that are important to be, uh, to be taken into account. First of all is the target population, of course, the population that get finally the disease or the population of interest. In this case, it would be the humans. Of course, there's a non-target population or populations. Those are the potentially susceptible host populations which are epidemiologically connected with the target population. And this is what we usually call the reservoir in general terms. However, there are other issues that I must take into account First is the critical community size, because this is the minimum size of a closed population in which a pathogen can persist in an indefinite way. So this is very important, because without such critical community size, in general terms, the pathogen may fade out over time. Maintenance populations at the very end are those populations larger that the critical community size. So this means that they will propagate and they will maintain the pathogen in such a population. However, 
non-maintenance populations may exist as well in the correct responding environment. And those are defined as the populations which are uh, smaller than the critical community size. Anyway, one may say that a non-maintenance population, the problem will fade up uh, uh, in a matter of time, probably. And for example, we have been talking about the palm civets here. Might be the palm civets doesn't play a major role, as uh, Dr. Poon said, or might be yes, and they are simply a non-maintenance population in the whole system. Or the maintenance community. In fact, maintenance community tells us that might be a number of non-maintenance populations create the sufficient critical mass for which afterwards the pathogen can be kept into the system. So at the very end, this summing up of non-maintenance populations create a maintenance community and then it behaves as the maintenance population that we have referred to earlier. And finally, of course, the source population, because the source population means the one that will transmit the infection directly to the target population. And this makes sense because, as I told you, might be the reservoir is constituted by more than one population and even more than one species. So at the very end, probably it will be one, the, the one that will transmit to the target uh, population. And don't be afraid for those, uh, for those graphics here. Uh, I will try to explain in a, in a moment. But here you can see, for example, what it's called the non-maintenance population. Remember, that so the size is lower than the clinical community size. It's uh, like a, a round, a circle. The maintenance population here is represented at the square, so the size is bigger than the critical community uh, size. We have the target population in gray. Let's think that those are the, the human. Maintenance community. This could happen when you have two non-maintenance population, but all together, if they interact, corresponds to a maintenance community. And finally, the definition of reservoir. In fact, the reservoir is not this issue that we may explain. For example, in this case, it coincides because it looks like that we have a maintenance population that transmit to the target population. And this, of course, configures the reservoir. But there are much more complex situations at the very end because wha what you see here with those dashed gray areas correspond to the reservoir. So this means that the reservoir can be constituted by a number of populations because at the very end might be one by itself doesn't, it's not able to keep the virus uh, in, in there, but when they are interacting with another one, this is feasible or with several of them, for example. So at the very end, we are not just talking about reservoir thinking on one single species, but the concept is to go for a target reservoir system, which may include much complicated things or much complex things like the ones indicated here. And just, I will give just an example using exactly the same approach that the group of Haydn and colleagues presented uh, in, the, in the paper. And in fact, uh, took an example with the potential complexity of the rabies reservoir in a particular part of Africa in Zimbabwe and how it may work in, the, in a potential intervention. And for example, uh, in fact, it, uh, in Zimbabwe, it was uh, observed and it was demonstrated that jackals may harbor rabies virus and eventually may play a role in transmission. However, the role of the chacal in the whole uh, rabies epidemiology has not been well defined. And at this point, they consider different uh, scenarios. So imagine that uh, there's an, a scenario in which, of course, dogs plays a major role in, in rabies transmission to humans. Uh, however, chacals, together with other wild carnivore populations, then they configure a maintenance population altogether. Or maybe jackals are just uh, of sufficient critical uh, size as being a maintenance population by itself. But of course, if this is the case, if they conceal on a maintenance population, the single vaccination of dogs will probably not work and will not cause fate up of the, of the problem. However, in the case that the chacal is not a maintenance community from this point of view, then dog vaccination is very likely to work. 
because at the very end, the major real risk for rabies transmission comes almost exclusively from the dogs. So this, of course, is on the theoretical uh, plane. So this means that one must study specifically the epidemiological situation of the target reservoir system for each species and for each disease, which makes, of course, things more complicated. I know that in most of the cases, we would like to have something which is simple. We have such animal reservoir, just that which transmits, and that is not such easy, probably. Oops. Anyway, uh, sometimes uh, the identification of the reservoir is not that easy. Uh, in fact, uh, of course, a reservoir should uh, kept with some characteristics. First of all, needs to maintain the pathogen and to have a feasible transmission route. This is important, otherwise it, uh, this uh, reservoir will not behave as a such. And there are some uh, investigations indicated that the high genetic similarity of the pathogen found in the reservoir system helps, of course, if we have a virus which is able to infect a number of a species, the possibility of an interspecies jump increases significantly. The high degree of functional similarity in terms of infectivity and viability among the two, spe uh, the two species, so this helps a lot. A spatial and temporal connectivity, because of course if there's no connection, like for example it has been indicated on the issue of bats, maybe another SARS outbreak will come along but it's very, very difficult to predict from this point of view. So at the very end, this temporal connectivity, we never know if it will happen again or not. This is something that we'll see. And of course, they have to maintain the pathogen viability. And the same authors took some examples. Uh, and in those some examples, of course, the target population was the human, the non-target population was different animal species, and even the main transmission route could be different among them. But when they look at the high genetic similarity of the viruses found in both species and even in the functional similarity, they saw that not in all cases, but in most of them were very, very similar. So at the very end, this facilitates the possibility of an effective transmission. Moreover, uh, in some cases, and of course in others it's much quicker, but it may require years of field and experimental work uh, in order to uh, to uh, set finally the, the reservoir. And of course, if it takes a long time, this limits in a very important way the possibility of an intervention or let's say an effective intervention. And this is a very interesting work that has been published this year but, uh, by Yavan and colleagues in which they uh, claim that they may predict the reservoir host, including some arthropod vectors, based on evolutionary signatures in RNA virus genomes. In fact, they use uh, phylogeny as well as machine learning, so they were they based on uh, artificial intelligence in order to establish some algorithms able to predict a priori the potential uh, reservoir of a particular detected virus. And uh, here, just uh, as an example, here you can see the potential reservoir, and here are novel viruses that have been discovered very recently, and the likelihood in terms of color, so the darker color, the higher likelihood, and the, uh, the clear color, less likelihood, of being this particular species a reservoir for the virus. So from this point of view, it's true that uh, it may help because it may narrow down the possibility of investigations in terms of a species. However, even that system, which is quite interesting, has some limitations at the very end. Of course, the advantage is that decrease the time by, uh, between virus discovery and targeted research. That, that's very clear. And even helps in the possibility of establishing right away surveillance and management specifically oriented to a particular reservoir. But there are some disadvantages as well because is the accuracy of the whole system. At the very end, the prediction of vector type was 91%, which is not that bad. I would say that it's really, really high. But for the host type, it was not that high. It was 72%. But anyway, I'm pretty sure that those researchers will try to increase uh, the, the accuracy of, of the system. But in principle, it would be a very interesting setting to, to be implemented in the future. And of course, finally, if we have identified properly the reservoir or the target reservoir system, the next step is the intervention. What can we do in such a situation? 
and especially on the animal side? Well, here it will depend on a number of factors. First of all, on the policy. You know that for a certain uh, diseases, for a certain uh, species, etc., there are particular policies like might be cooling or quarantine or vaccination, etc. So it will depend on, on the region, country, or different parts of the world. Also on the diagnostic capabilities. The treatment prevention measures should be available because of course uh, sometimes it's not that, that easy. And finally, the likelihood of intervention because especially thinking on those uh, reservoir systems in which several species might be involved, might be it's relatively easy to impact over a particular species, but very difficult on others, and especially on wildlife. For example, we have been talking a little bit on bats, how difficult is to intervene on bats. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible. So from this point of view, uh, sometimes you, we have to refer to the real possibilities that we may have. And for the reason I, I will uh, end up with uh, some examples, because uh, most of you are uh, perfectly aware about avian flu, the highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza. For example, the most significant policy applied, I would say, in most of the countries worldwide, is the cool of animals. And for example, here you have two news that it's just from last year and this year. In France, cooling ducks, or that's 600,000 ducks, or in Iraq, cooling 35,000 chicks. And this is something which is interesting as well, because not especially referred to those particular uh, subtypes of influenza virus, but when you look at the literature, uh, as, uh, as long as it happened with SARS, for example, there are proto vaccine prototypes that work, and they can prevent in a relatively, let's say, efficacious way the, the problem. However, this is hardly applied or even simply non-registered products do exist in the market uh, already. So at the very end, there are much other factors related with policies, policies from the companies, et cetera, et cetera, that may jeopardize or not to have a vaccine in the market. Or for example, uh, Nipah virus infection. By the, the end of last century, 1998, 1999, so uh, several cases uh, were detected of Nipah virus infected in humans, which were uh, in previous contact with pigs, and uh, it was decided to cool a number of pigs, but look, it was close to one million pigs. So it was a huge amount of animals uh, that they were cooled, and even sometimes, such kind of cooling is not that easy. In fact, the army was involved in a very systematic way for controlling and for cooling those animals because we are not really prepared for such tremendous cooling of animals, really. Or for example, rabies, another example in which, well, we know that uh, the elimination of canine rabies in through mass vaccination works and works quite well in general terms. However, it's clear that there are some wildlife population that may maintain the virus there. However, and this is good news as well, so the rabies vaccine bait works as well. So it's something that can be used. And for example, in, uh, in Europe, the fox rabies has been eradicated or eliminated through the use of this rabies vaccine bait. And finally, another example for which there is no vaccine nowadays in the, in the market, but uh, uh, and also referring to the previous talk about mares, it looks like that uh, dromedary camels are very nice animals, so everybody wants to kiss them. Uh, so from this point of view, uh, probably this means that the capability of transmitting the virus by infected animals is rather, rather easy, especially because dromedary camels develop a very, let's say, mild flu, but excrete a lot of virus because the, the, the infection is mainly of the upper respiratory tract, so it's, it's very easy. But anyway, even we know that uh, the transmission or the dromedary camels uh, play a major role in the transmission, and even that at least it has been tested, a prototype vaccine that is decreasing significantly the, the excretion of, uh, of uh, MERS coronavirus in dromedary camels, so far even it's in different phases of development, it's not uh, still in the market. Uh, and the point here is, would be able to uh, vaccinate dromedary camels because might be people will not be willing to do so because at the very end, those animals do not have any disease. It's just a, a zoonotic problem mainly. So anyway, just to finalize, uh, just to emphasize on that most emerging or emerging diseases are of zoonotic or vector-borne uh, vector origin. 
that the reservoir is a complex network of populations in which the pathogen is maintained and from which the infection is transmitted to the target population. So to my understanding, much complex that in most of the cases we believe that animal and vector reservoirs might be potentially predicted based on signatures of viral genomes. And probably this is something that in the future will go on in a more important way. And finally, that most of the control measures at the reservoir level when feasible, because this is very important, when feasible, imply mainly cooling or immunization because uh, the action can be eventually taken on wildlife, but uh, again, this is one of the most difficult parts to be done. And just to acknowledge all the groups, especially working wi with MERS uh, lately in our, in our center, and just to uh, make you an announcement that it will come along uh, next Friday, but the next GBN meeting will take place in Barcelona next year. So it's between 9 and 12 of June, so please, uh, take it in your uh, in your agenda so do not wait for tomorrow thank you very much for your attention <laughs>